We've been preaching and going through uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is uh, Paul's great teaching about the resurrection. Uh, we saw a few things about, um, in, in our previous few sermons, we saw that there are people who in Paul's day in the church were denying the resurrection, uh, just as much as people do today. Uh, the resurrection sounds crazy to people. Uh, in Paul's day, just like in ours, we tend to think that people are, they're either disembodied spirits or it's some kind of self that's really far away that we have to try to attain either in this life or the next. Or people believe, as they did then and do now, that death is just the end and people decay into nothingness because consciousness and all life is just chemistry. Things actually haven't changed as much as you might think in 2,000 years. But Paul was saying that if you deny the resurrection, you deny the very heart of Christian faith. He went so far as to say that if there's no resurrection, then Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, he's not really the king because he hasn't conquered death. And if he hasn't conquered death, why do you think he's conquered sin? He hasn't conquered anything. So Jesus is a fake if there's no resurrection. Paul then said, but Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of the harvest, to use a, an agricultural metaphor that he'll use in a later sermon as well. All people will be raised. We saw that in uh, one man all die, but in um, in Christ, all will be made alive. We saw that the resurrection was the culmination of the kingdom. The kingdom is a teaching that's been lost to the church for quite a long time, even though it's right at the heart of the Lord's Prayer when we say, Thy kingdom come. When Christ's kingdom finally does come, that is when death will finally be destroyed, and all the powers, as Paul says, every power that means all reigns and authorities and human powers, everything will be put in subjection under Christ. We saw that what this means is that right now, the world is not ruled by God as we like to think it is, right? If, if we're waiting for Christ's kingdom, if we're waiting for him to overcome the powers of this world, well, that means he hasn't done it yet. And that is... Why Paul would teach that there's evil in the world. Because God isn't yet fully all in all. And we, we expect a bit too much. We forget what our mission is as Christians if we think that God is presently ruling over all things. God's mission for us, as we've been talking about, is that we would be a people who would rule with him. God is giving us the opportunity to demonstrate our worthiness by reigning in the same way that Christ did, by loving others, even our enemies. So let's read what Paul goes on to say in the next section, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 29 to 34. So just before this, he's saying that, you know, all this about all things are going to be put under subjection so that God would be all in all. So now he continues, otherwise, uh, if the dead aren't raised, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? I'll just say that at this point, we're not talking about this much, but this is a, a practice that most scholars are completely baffled by. They can't actually say what this was if if they were baptizing actually dead people, which a few people might think, or if they were uh, baptizing others on behalf of people who are dead, baptizing living people. But in any case, it didn't last. The, the point is, is that um, this is a reason Paul is saying, look, people believe in the resurrection, so much so that they uh, think the dead will come back to life and need to, uh, baptism. So he goes on in verse 30, why are we in danger every hour? If the resurrection isn't true, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. 
What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? He's referring to uh, his ministry in Ephesus where he was uh, kind of run out of town. He didn't actually face wild beasts. Um, He says, if the dead are not raised, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals or good character. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So Paul takes a little diversion away from teaching what resurrection looks like to say, these are the risks that I am prepared to undergo because I believe in this resurrection stuff. There are people who deny it, but I'm willing to go to great lengths I'm willing to die every day, to to put my life in danger in order so people would see the resurrection. People would understand who Christ is and how he is the king of all things. So, and Paul did, of course, go through a lot of, of, of hardship. So he's saying if there's no resurrection, life is kind of like a gladiator contest, uh, you know, a gladiator, the night before the event, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to party hard because they're going to die tomorrow. And most of the time, the Romans weren't really satisfied until it was a complete bloodbath and everybody was dead, including the animals. That's what life is like for many people. There's a, uh, there's a saying that goes around among younger people that says, well, they make it an acronym, YOLO. You only live once, right? You only live once. It's that same idea that you could die tomorrow, so you might as well try something new today. You never know what's going to happen. Carpe diem, seize the day, right? Do something crazy because who knows? Tomorrow could be the end. Paul doesn't agree with this. If there's no resurrection, then yes, party. But if there is... Maybe something different needs to happen. Now, maybe a lot of you haven't heard of this phrase, you only live once, but I want to contrast it with one you will have heard of, and you need to understand the way I'm putting this as a contrast. Um, We in America celebrate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, these rights that we think are given to us by the Creator um, are kind of like you only live once in a way, if you think about it. It's about we need to pursue life, we need to pursue freedom, and we need to pursue what makes us happy. You have to live your best life now, free and happy to do whatever you want. Paul, on the other hand, is doing something different. Paul is saying, well, I'm not so happy, right? I I die every day. I'm facing all these hardships because I believe in the resurrection. He's not facing liberty. He continuously gets arrested for being a servant of Christ because he is the servant of a different king. And he's not really pursuing his own happiness or or preserving his life. He goes to great trouble to risk it all. And not in a way that gives him joy because he gets to experience something new, but because he's getting to experience people coming to know who God is. Why would Paul risk his life? Why would he suffer when he could have the good life? Paul was a Roman citizen. We know he had a decent life before Jesus came and upset everything. Life could be good. So why in the world would Paul do this crazy stuff? You see, Paul is convinced that his own personal flourishing, his own personal happiness, his liberty, his life, going after that is a false purpose. See, if, if this life is all that there is, then yes, let's do whatever we want and be as free to do anything and be as happy as we can be because tomorrow we'll be dead anyway. What Paul is saying is that's a pagan way of thinking because if you believe in the resurrection, you believe that what you do right now has eternal purpose. What you're doing now 
your works will follow you into eternity. God isn't going to just wipe everything out. He promised not to do that again at the flood. He's not going to start with a, a blank slate. Resurrection isn't uh, some kind of like magical uh, making everything brand new like it was in Eden. Resurrection is taking you and all of your life story, raising you back up in Christ's kingdom where God will rule and God will be all in all. There will be no more weeping. He will wipe away every tear. This is our hope. Not that we are a disembodied spirit that, that uh, maybe doesn't remember half the stuff. Um, these are ideas that have been with us for three, 4,000 years, and people still believe it today. But Paul is saying, if you believe in the resurrection, then what you do right now matters. Which goes to mean, hey, it's not all about you, right? It's about God and his kingdom. What are you doing for Christ and his kingdom? That's what Paul is teaching. Paul thinks it's worth suffering. Paul thinks his life, in order to have some great and eternal purpose, is going to involve some kind of suffering because the world does not want to hear that there's a different king, that personal happiness is a false end, and that there is life after death, that we will be accountable for all things we do. He's willing to suffer and die daily because he believes in the resurrection of the dead. Now, funny enough, this, is, uh, this passage is one of the first sermons I ever preached on. And I remember preaching, this is a church in Colorado Springs, probably eight years ago or so. Um, and I preached about people denying the resurrection today in practical terms. And people didn't get it. They didn't really understand what I was saying because every Christian believes in the resurrection. I mean, that's just one of those boxes you check off when you become a Christian. We say it every time we say the Apostles' Creed. But what I was trying to get at, and maybe I'll be better at it this time, is that we deny the resurrection in practice when we live in a certain way that what we do doesn't matter for eternity, right? If we live for ourselves, essentially we deny the resurrection. We deny that Christ is our king, and we think we're the kings. Uh, if I'm the king, I might as well eat and drink because tomorrow I'll die. So Paul starts to shame the church in Corinth. He says, you know, you, you guys think you've got it, but he says, wake up. Wake up from your drunken stupor. You're going around like drunk people, thinking you're doing the right thing, but completely unaware that you're making fools of yourselves. You see, they are denying the resurrection, and often so are we. We do it in these practical terms when we live for ourselves. The gospel of Paul is the exact opposite of the values of our world today. As I said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is kind of the opposite of the life of Christian discipleship. Now, I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm very happy to live in a country where I'm not persecuted. But what I'm saying is to be a Christian disciple is not the same as believing in the rights and liberties that we have as American. They're two different things. What Paul is saying is, look, this is the way that a disciple lives full of hope and promise for the future, so much so that we're willing to give up life, we're willing to give up liberty, and we're willing to give up our own pursuit of happiness to follow Jesus. This is a radical message, and we know what happens to people who preach it. Paul preached it, Jesus preached it, and most of the disciples preached it, and they all ended up dead. Because they're challenging what lies at the heart of our societies that we live in this great world where we're just each trying to get our own way and we're trying to work it out so we don't hurt each other too much in the process of each getting our own way, when Paul and Jesus are telling us that's the wrong way to do it. The life of discipleship, if you want to know who God is and what his kingdom is like, you need to give up your life for your enemy. Paul teaches that while we were still sinners, while we were God's enemies, what did God do? Did he strike back at us? Did he kill us all off? Uh, did, 
Did he turn his back on us? No. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if you want to know what the life of a disciple looks like, it looks like that. Those people who are against you, those are the people you're to give your life for. Now the irony of this idea that we only live once is that it actually treats life as really cheap. We take crazy risks. We do weird and stupid things. We try drugs of various kinds because uh, you might die anyway. We try everything once to please ourselves. See, the resurrection, again, it treats life as eternally meaningful. And that is why life has purpose. And that is why, as Christians, we can celebrate life. Because we're willing to die so that others might have it eternally. Paul talks about that bad company corrupts good character. What he's saying is these Corinthians are hanging out with the wrong people. They're denying the resurrection. And the reason they're doing that is because they're hanging out with the wrong people. They're listening to other people. They're getting their news from other people. They're listening to the interests of of money, of power, of self-interest. They're listening to the voice of you only live once. And they are corrupted because of it. I want to challenge you to turn off the news, even for a whole week. Every time you're tempted to turn it on, and acknowledge the dismal state of the world. Read the Bible. Read about the resurrection. Because there's no hope in the news. Those hopes, again, in in politics and in economics and whatever field, have been deceiving people for thousands of years of human history. We haven't quite fixed it yet, have we? We haven't quite succeeded in building this utopia that we're always being promised. That's because you don't only live once, and if you try to do that, you will create uh, the world that we live in. We need to wake up. Wake up from your drunken stupor. There are people who don't know about God. And that's really where Paul is coming down on this. There are people who don't know about Christ being the king. Because we're not spending our time living it. We're not spending our time talking about it. We live in a town where the majority of people, as I've said many times, two-thirds of our town are not involved in any religious group. 66% of the people around you don't worship any God, let alone the God of Jesus Christ. Yet this church has been here for 149 years. How does that work? And there's dozens of churches in this town. How does that work? That's what Paul is saying. I say this to all of our shame. We live in a town where Christianity has declined immensely. And the responsibility falls squarely right here on all of us. Because we have been led astray by a false gospel. A gospel of helping ourselves, about being Uh, proud of who we are, a gospel that uh, that looks to our own interests, that uses God to help us get what we want out of life, rather than asking us to serve one another. There are people who don't know about God. And in this season of our time, we need to understand that This is our responsibility. We're denying the resurrection. We're denying that what we're doing is actually important here. Talking about God. Is this the most important part of your week? Probably not. Probably not even part of mine. Because we don't actually believe that it's making a difference. So I think it's time to get serious about Christian faith. We're coming to a a radical time in Western history, bigger than the Reformation. This is a time that is, uh, during my lifetime, I will see uh, the, the church either fall flat on its face and America will become just like Europe where church buildings like this will be auction houses and bars and restaurants as it is all over Europe. Either we'll see Christianity fail miserably, or we will recognize our sin and turn a page 
and become a new force of life and a voice of God's kingdom. So make a choice. Who do you want to follow? Do you want to celebrate that we have the right to our own lives, that we have the right to pursue our own happiness, that we have the right to our own freedoms? Those are all nice things, but the call of the gospel is something different. We need to celebrate with Paul that we are willing to die every day, to die every day for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we're willing to give up our personal rights and liberties for the sake of other people. In the old days, we sent missionaries. We paid for other people to do it for us, and they went to foreign nations. And now, the, the root of their support is dried up because the church in America is drying up. Now it's time for all of us to be missionaries, as we always should have been. Do we want to be a missionary for Christ? Or do we want God to help us live an abundant life here and now, to make us happy, to make us free, uh, to to make our way known and other people's ways uh, perish in our way? There are two different gospels here. One where God is here to help us succeed, and the other where we acknowledge that God is our king and we want to serve him and announce the coming of his kingdom. Two very different gospels. We need to wake up from our drunken stupor because history is telling us that what we've been doing for 149 years is not working. Nobody's listening. And there's a reason for that. So let us stop sinning because there are people who don't know about Christ. How are we going to learn more about Christ's kingdom? How are you going to show it to your neighbor? How am I going to? I don't want you to think that I've got it right. I certainly don't. But let's talk about it. Let's meet together. Let's think about it. What can we do for those who are suffering and dying in our own community because they don't know who Jesus is? This is the heart of what we do. That's why we have a cross right in the middle in front of us. So let's choose today to serve Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Sometimes we thank you for Jesus and Sometimes we don't want to thank you. Sometimes, honestly, we don't want any part of your gospel. We don't want any part of the life of Paul. We don't want any part of, of dying, of being chased by wild beasts of other people who hate us because we're preaching a message of hope that asks people to lay down their lives for their neighbors. God, we confess that too often we don't want any part of that. We want you to serve us. We want you to serve our agendas. We want you to give us hope through the things that we can do, through the worlds that we can invent, through the false hopes that we give to others. Lord, we confess that we don't want you to be our king. We confess that we want you to be our servant. So Father, forgive us. Forgive us for denying the resurrection in practical life by, by li- thinking that we live once, that being so scared of, of death that we treat life as cheap and we try anything to make ourselves happy. Lord, forgive us. Send us your spirit once again to teach us what your kingdom looks like, to teach us all of those parables about forgiving others, about the Good Samaritan, about selling everything to go for the pearl of great price. Lord, give us that reality of your kingdom that we would desire to serve you, that we would boldly stare down death every day because we're so confident that you have conquered it and that we will one day rise again with you. And Lord, teach us that every minute of our lives is meaningful 
and that we're serving somebody. So Lord, give us the courage to choose to serve you instead of ourselves. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.